This is such a pain. All right, well, I'm just going to live with it. Uh, so I do have the lecture question on Discord open. If anybody can ask questions and get this GIF off of the, the chat, it would be fantastic. That's extremely distracting. It's from one of my TAs in 1.16, too. I, gotta, I might have to have a chat. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you, Grub Grub. Yeah, if you can get it up to get that off of my, my uh, peripheral vision here. Uh, so let's talk about file uploads. Uh, we, we saw how to do multi-part forms last time, but I had one slide on the format of what you're going to get when you receive a multi-part form request. Today I want to focus on parsing those requests. That's what we'll talk about today. If you looked ahead at the slides, I do have some slides at the end about security. I'm going to push those off until Friday, and we'll just talk about parsing this thing. And if you have any questions, especially if you started writing the code and you hit some snags on this, let me know, and let's uh, make sure everybody knows how to parse these file uploads. So when we have our form, when we want to have file uploads, we have to use this multi-part form data encoding type in our form. If we don't have that, we won't be able to upload files. I demoed briefly at the end of last lecture that when you have a file upload without multi-part form data, the browser is only going to send the name of the file, which is not of much importance to us. We don't really, we don't really care. It's not that important. Um, so if you ever see that you're only getting the file name, you know, you don't have that multi-part form data. It's an easy office hours question. I'm only getting a file name. What the hell is going on? Did you do multi-part form data? And if you've ever done development in any framework, anything uh, where you need to support file uploads, you've noticed that you've had to have this. It's because nobody can get around that restriction. You need to have multi-part form data encoding type, or else when you have, uh, no matter what uh, web framework you have, it's not going to get the file contents. It's not going to be able to parse it because the data is just not there. The browser won't send it. So you have to have this on your form. Coding type multi-part form data, or else you can't in post, or else you can't, uh, can't upload files. So we have to have that. Once we have that, we're going to get the information in this format. We'll be staring at this format uh, most of lecture. This, uh, we'll go over the text example again, and then we'll talk about the file upload example in depth. So when we want to upload files, on the HTML side, pretty simple. Same setup that we had before. We already know how to do all that. And we just change the type from text to file. And that's it. Once you have that type of file, when you open your web page, that's going to look like this. I didn't do anything special. Let me refresh so my, my population isn't there. Uh, I didn't do anything special. This is the form that we just saw in the slides. All I did was change text to file. And the browser gives us this input. It'll look a little different in each browser, but this is built by the browser. We're going to have this button that you click. And it's going to open the file system for your operating system, show you your files, and let you browse your files. So whenever you've uploaded a file, you've seen this before. That's built into your browser. That's not part of, um, uh, that's not part of anything a developer built for their web app specifically. They just said input type file, done. Uh, some, if the formatting is different here, they might have built some custom HTML, did some custom stuff to make it look a little different. Uh, but once it has the file picker here, it's going to be part of the browser showing you that uh, in combination with the operating system. This will look different in each operating system. Then I can go show all files. It's going to open up all of my files. Sorry, Andrew. Leaking information there. Uh, but that's going to be all present just by changing that type to file. So on the front end, not much work for us. Input type file, let the browser and the operating system handle everything else for file uploads. Now we get a request in a little bit different format. And I'm only showing the body here, not the headers. We'll go back and visit the headers in a second. But we're going to get the body of a request looking like this now, where instead of just the text, we're going to have all the bytes of the file. So in the body of each one of these parts, we're going to have the bytes of the content that's being sent. So these are going to be the bytes. These bytes just happen to be UTF-8 bytes, so they display as a UTF-8 string. 
But down here, we're going to have the bytes of the file that we're interested in that we have to be parsing. Yes? So those last, last two dots dashing that mm -hmm. they found, that's in the bottom Yeah, that, that's saying this is the last boundary, which I'm not sure why they're, they have, they don't have to be there. I'm not sure why they're always there. Uh, because you're going to read the content length, and once you read that many bytes, and you see that it ends in a boundary, you're going to know it's the end of the boundary. Um, but the protocol says that it should be there. Might be an artifact from previous, uh, you know, generations, not generations ago. The internet's not that old. Um, but a previous time where that was important in help parsing. Uh, but regardless, it will be there on the last boundary. So, and we'll revisit that on the previous slide. I, I'm not moving on from that yet. We're going to revisit that the rest of the lecture, most of the lecture. So when we're reading files, remember when we're sending files, when we're sending images, any file that's, any content really that's not UTF-8 encoded, anything that's not text, we had to be very careful never to convert those bytes into a string accidentally because it's, those bytes don't represent strings. It's not UTF-8. It's not valid UTF-8. Uh, we can't um, convert them to strings. When sending files, this wasn't too bad. You just had to make sure to not convert it to a string by accident. So you had to form your headers, that blank line, and then convert that to bytes, and then append the bytes of the image to the end of your response, and then ship it. Now we're on the other side of that. Our users are going to be sending us files, and we still have to be careful not to convert those bytes into strings. Do not treat those bytes as strings. But it's a little tougher now because we have a lot of information surrounding those bytes that we do need to interpret, or I shouldn't say need to, that are encoded as strings. So now we have the string information, and then right in the middle, right in the middle of all the string encoding, we have the bytes of a file. We have a boundary right after, we have headers right before, we have other information in the, the body. So we have to be very careful to never interpret the bytes of that image as a string. This is important when we're sending images. It's uh, as important but trickier when we're receiving the bytes of an image. All right, so now let's look at the full request and talk about how we're going to parse these multi-part form requests. So first, you're going to do Similar to what you've, I mentioned this not until the end, way at the end. All right, uh, I guess I'll save that for the end then. So the first thing you want to do is what you've been doing so far. You're going to look at the request line and look at what this request is requesting. And here we're going to see that it's a post using our form path, whatever path it is. Um, uh, that we want to handle. So post request at the path slash form path. By that, you can tell what you need to be looking for when you're parsing this thing. So since we're getting a request for form path, we know we're going to be looking for a multi-part form um, encoded body. So we know we're going to be looking for that. So with that path, we know the next thing we need to look at uh, because the path is a post, the next thing we need to look for is the content length. This is going to be the number of bytes to be read in the body of the message. We need to read this content length to know how many bytes to read and make sure that we get that many bytes from the TCP stream, not including the headers or this blank line. So everything after this blank line, starting with this dash in this case, this should be 9,937 bytes. We want to make sure we read exactly that many bytes from the body of the body of this request. If we didn't read that many bytes, we need to read again from our, uh, from our stream. And we'll talk about that in depth. I think it's Monday uh, when we talk about buffers. Buffers and buffering, uh, we'll talk about it in depth. I'll have some examples. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Right now, we want to focus on parsing this multi-part stuff, though. So content length, making sure to read that full content length. And then the content type. And of course, there will be a lot more headers here if you're using a browser uh, that I'm omitting. These are the important ones that we need to read. 
the content type, just like when we specified char type UTF-8, we'll have extra information here, which is going to be the boundary. So the content type is going to be multi-part form data, which means there is no one content type. I guess the content type is just multi-part form data. But each part of the form, each piece of data here, can have its own content type. So we'll have multiple content types in the request that we're receiving, this post request. So since we have multiple types, we can't just say like text plane or application JSON. We can't do any of that right here. So we're just going to say multi-part form data. That's our cue that, hey, there's going to be multiple pieces of information potentially with different content types in this request. Now in the text one, there were both text, uh, text inputs. And uh, we didn't really have to think too much about the content types. But now we do because we have text and an image being sent in the same request. And the boundary. Boundary equals, and then everything following that, the value for the key boundary is going to be some randomish looking string. It should be different each time. Uh, I guess that depends on how the browser, uh, how your browser behaves, what version of which browser you have. Um, but this should be treated as a random string that needs to be read each time. Any questions so far? Yeah. So for the multi-part form data, is there like a limit to how much pieces of data we can put on to that? No. Uh, no? Nope. Like if we were to have like a bundle of images, we could send that with like a text file and whatnot. If you had a bundle of images, as long as your form on the front end has a slot for each image, so like if you had you know, uh, a, an input of type file, image one, image two, image three, et cetera, uh, which you could even build dynamically. I guess you could do that in JavaScript. Like have it when you fill up and then click more images and then have it generate more inputs dynamically. You could build all that and have an unlimited number of images or have your users upload a zip file. Uh, but, uh, but there's no limit. HTTP doesn't specify any limit to the number of fields in a content type. I'm sure you've, you've had a form you know, that's going to ask uh, what's your street address, city, state, zip, you know, all kinds of stuff in this big old form with all kinds of information. That'll all be received as most likely a request in this exact format. Uh, there can be any number. There's no limit. There's no limit specified by the spec. Oh, by the way, there is, I have it linked on the website, but I didn't mention it in lecture. This multi-part form uh, uh, type has its own RFC. So just like HTTP has an RFC specifying everything for HTTP, there is a separate one for multi-part form data. So anything specific about this, you can check out that RFC if you want the definitive answer of what is multi-part form data. That RFC is going to give you all of the juicy bits, all of those really small details of exactly how to do this. So if you're ever questioning how to parse this and you're like, man, Jesse's slides just didn't do it for me, uh, go to the spec, or even if they do do it for you, uh, it's always helpful to go to the RFCs. Go to the RFC and get that definitive answer. That is what the spec is. That's what any developer who's writing a browser, that's their source of truth. Whenever we're writing servers, that's our source of truth. Uh, the RFC is what the standard is. And anybody who's not complying with that is wrong. So if you're complying with that and the browser isn't, you know, you can file a bug report for that browser and be like, hey, you got to fix your stuff because you're not in compliance with the RFC. That is the source of truth. <clears throat> and then the body. I already mentioned this one, but make sure you read content length number of bytes before you parse the body, anything in the body of the request. So. Look for that number of bytes to be read after all of the headers. If you haven't read that many bytes, you're not ready to parse the body. Because if you haven't read that many bytes, you know, what if you've only read the bytes up to here? And you start looking for boundaries? Well, you're not going to find any because you didn't read enough bytes to even get the boundary once. Uh, and your parser is not going to work, obviously. So make sure you read all of the content before uh, trying to parse anything in the body. And the multi-part form is going to have multiple parts. 
So here we have a form with two parts. Uh, the input named commenter, where I inputted Jesse, and an input named upload, where I upload the file discord.png with the bytes of the file right here. So when I upload those two pieces of information, this is what the request looks like server side. This is what you're going to get. This is, this is the exact information that you'll get. This is a, you know, an actual request, of course, where I just removed all the irrelevant headers so I could fit this on a slide. Uh, but this is uh, what a request is going to look like on your end when somebody uploads a PNG in this case. So we notice a few things. Each time, I should have this one highlighted too. I think I mentioned it spe specifically because it has that trailing dash. Uh, we're going to look for that boundary with two leading dashes. It's important to append those two leading dashes. If you don't, then those two leading dashes you're going to be treating them as part of the content of the previous input. Come on, just let me highlight it. Like, why? <laughs> but, but you'll have Jesse new line dash dash uh, in your, uh, in your, in, in your data. Uh, we don't want that dash dash. If you have that at the end of the bytes of a file, it's going to ruin the encoding of the file. You won't be able to read that JPEG. If your JPEGs aren't displayed when you save those files on your server and they're all corrupted images, that's one thing to look for. Make sure you don't have that trailing dash dash on your, uh, in your data. Make sure when you have the boundary, read the boundary here. Prepend a dash dash to it. And then that's the boundary that you're looking for in your data. So that's how you're going to separate each of these parts. Everything between the boundaries is going to be your content. Now the last boundary is going to be a little bit special, and that's going to have that trailing dash dash. So make sure you look for that. Uh, it, depending on how you write your parser, you know, if you forget that it's there or you don't handle this as a special case, just remember that that last, say you're splitting on the, these boundaries, just remember that you'll have an extra element in your array that's only going to contain dash dash. So don't try to accidentally treat this as though it's a whole piece of data with headers and a blank line and bytes of information. Uh, that's an easy mistake to make. Forgetting that trailing dash dash, you're going to have an array where index 0 is this, index 1 is this, and index 2 is this. If you try to parse index 2, you're going to have a bad time. It's not going to parse the way you expect it to because it's just literally dash dash. So make sure you keep that in mind. Don't try to parse dash dash as, uh, as a field in the multi-part form, as a separate part. So each part is going to have its own set of headers, a blank line, and then the bytes of information. This is the same format as HTTP requests or HTTP responses. Same exact format except we don't have a request line or a status line. So it's just like that, except the very first line here doesn't exist. We don't have anything like that. We just jump right to the headers. So we get to the headers, a blank line, which is a slash r slash n slash r slash n, and then the bytes of the information that we want. In the headers, we're guaranteed to have, we're guaranteed to have at least content disposition. This is the only required header. And this is going to tell us a little bit about the input. Most importantly to us is the name of the input. If we look up the name of the input, honestly, we can probably infer the rest. Um, but we're going to look for the name of the input to figure out which piece of information is being read. This uh, either commenter or upload, where upload is the name of the input of type file uh, that I have. I showed that right. So I changed the name to upload here. So upload and commenter. Whatever these names are in the HTML, that's what the name is going to be right here. And these headers follow the same format as headers. Everything's the same here. This is where, where I, I'm really serious when I say, in homework one, hopefully a lot of you listened, write a generic parser for these, because you're going to use it throughout the entire semester. Write a nice generic parser. Don't be, I see so many students going, like looking for the string name equals quote, 
and then taking everything after that and ignoring the, like doing really silly stuff, or just saying, if they get the part, and then they say, if contains name equals commenter, like, I mean, it can work, but you'll save yourself a lot of time if you just write one header parser that's going to take the header. Your headers are going to be a key value pair with optional key value pairs after a semicolon or separated by semicolons. If you just write one parser once and put that information in a nice data structure, it's going to save you a lot of time later on. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. No. no, the headers can show up in any order. So and to avoid that, don't put them in an array. You should be putting them in a key value store where, uh, where order doesn't matter anyway. So when you have your generic parser, like for your requests and, and for these, you should be putting these in a key value store where you have a key content length, which maps to this, a key content type, which maps to this, and when you're ready to parse, like you throw your generic parser from homework one at this, and then you go to the map that's returned, and you say, hey, map, give me the value for content type. And then it's going to give you, hopefully, this already parsed. It's going to return, hopefully, some object uh, of a class that you created named header, or whatever you want to name it, but probably header. And then say, hey, if you had extra information, give me the boundary, and it should have that extra information if this is your request. If you're expecting a multi-part form request, uh, get the boundary, and then that just spits out that value. It should be that simple to say, OK, the header's already parsed. I know that because I just took my raw request and threw it at my parser. Give me content type. Go to header.extra information of boundary, and then you get your boundary. It should be that simple in homework, too. If you're doing more work than that, then you didn't take my advice in homework one, and you got some extra work to do in homework two because you didn't do it earlier. My suspicion, I suspect that most of you did not do that. Uh, you probably have at least a basic header parser, but not reading the extra values. So you have to add the look for semicolons, split on semicolons, and adding that information. That's my guess of where at least a good portion of the class is. Probably have your headers in key value stores, but not looking at the extra information with the semicolons. So adding that for homework two uh, will help. Uh, we're not done with headers. Headers are going to persist throughout the entire semester. Having that information, having that code is going to help you. Or else you're rewriting. You know, don't, don't do duplicate work for every homework assignment. It's just wasting your time. It's just uh, creating a lot more work for you. So that's my advice. You know, heed it or not. You know, it, it, that's up to you. But uh, it's a way that you can make the end of semester a lot smoother, if that's what you're into. So we're going to read the content disposition to get the type again in our generic parser. We're going to parse, we're going to parse these headers and say, OK, header named content disposition. What was your name extra field? If it's upload, then I know I'm working with the file. And then I'm going to throw that in my file parser uh, and have some code that's going to uh, read those bytes of the file and uh, save them as a file. We're going to get the file name that the user uploaded. This generally isn't important to us, at least for our purposes in this class. Maybe in, I don't know, is it ever important? I don't think it's really ever important. Uh, maybe some apps out there care about this. But you notice you upload a file to any website ever. The link to that file is going to be some random looking string. It's not going to be the file name that you uploaded. Because there's like an immediate problem. I upload discord.png to your server, and some other user also uploads a file named discord.png. What do you do? What do you do then? So the file names are randomly generated, ran well, randomly, like pseudo randomly uh, generated uh, when you upload a file so that the file names can be unique. Uh, that's uh, pretty common that we're not going to care what the file name was that the user uploaded. Oh, I can't think of a thing. Like if you upload a file and they want to display the original file name uh, to other users. I'm thinking like when you upload a resume, I think that's common. It'll keep the name of your resume. 
if you attach a, a file to an email, uh, I guess uh, there are a few cases. Uh, for our purposes, building a web app where users can share files, we're not too concerned. Uh, but that information is there. If you're building an app where you do care about that, it's right there for you. And since you have your generic parser, you just say content disp disposition, give me your file name. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would have a data structure, like if I would have a, a map of strings to header types, which would be a type that I'd write. And then the header type would have the value and another key value store, so another map, uh, I'm thinking in Scala, uh, another map that maps these keys to the values. Then have a parser that parses through all that to give me that information. All of them can, according to the standard. Most of them won't. Like content length, you're probably never going to see a colon there, a semicolon, and then more information. So your parser has to look for that. If there is a semicolon, then uh, build that map. But if you have them as key value stores like that, then the key value store storing all this information for like the content type right here that doesn't have anything, just be empty. It's fine to have an empty key value store. Uh, so, so like in Python, that could be a dictionary. Uh, how would I want that in Python? I probably would just create a class still. You could try to get away with dictionary of string to dictionary, and then name this one value. But then once somebody uses value here, your parser would break. That's not the best idea. You probably have to use OOP in most languages. Or have, oh yeah, this is how, in Python. Uh, a dictionary that's going to take strings as keys, which will be you know, for all the headers. To get, if I want like content disposition, I'm going to have value, which maps to this value, and then something like extras. Uh, which is another key that maps to another dictionary that contains this information. So if you didn't want to use OOP, you want to use just the built-in data structures in like Python or JavaScript. Uh, that would be one way that I would do it. But however, you can get that information in one data structure for all your headers. It's going to save you a lot of time moving forward. And then each part can have any number of extra headers. Content disposition required for every part, extra headers can exist. For our files, at least content type is going to be required. If content type is omitted, it defaults to text plain. So this was just a plain text input on a form. No content type, so we assume it's plain text. Here we have a content type that's other than something other than plain text. And the browser decided that it was a PNG image. The browser looked at what file was being uploaded, because all we did was specify it's going to be a file. We didn't say it's going to be an image file or anything. So the browser saw that I uploaded a PNG, and it said, oh, this is a PNG. I'm going to set the content type accordingly to let the server know what type this is, what they should be expecting for their parsing. Yeah? So let's say we tell the parser that relies on having content type. Like, in the HTML, is there a way to make it so that the text slash plain come up for content type? In your, like right here? Yeah, like let's say you made a parser with the headers and it typically relies on having content type. For, for multi-part form data, you should have it default to text plain if it's okay. absent. You, you should have some code that looks for that. Because that's part of the standard for, uh, for multi-part form data. That's part of the standard is if it's missing. Th this isn't like, Oh, in practice, we assume it's text plain. It's actually part of the standard part of the RFC. So that's something your parser would have to handle. And there can be any number of additional headers here. There's one thing missing here, content length. Content length will not appear in any of the parts because it's not needed. 
There's no need for content length. That's redundant information. You have everything you need to determine the length of the content of each part. You already have it all. So the most important part of content length is letting us know how many bytes we need to read before we can start parsing. So the TCP socket, you know, we might get information in bursts. We might not get all of the information we want. Uh, TCP itself is just a stream of data. It's not, uh, it has no concept of packets or, um, I mean, it, it does at the IP side, I guess, uh, underneath. But for our purposes, for what we use TCP for on our end, it's effectively a stream of data. We can just keep getting data, keep reading data off of the stream. So we need to know when the current request ends. Because it's possible for somebody to send multiple requests over the same TCP connection. So we need to know when the, this request ends. First of all, once we read the whole thing, and when it ends. Content link does all that for us. So once we read this content link, we read all of this information, and we start parsing that many bytes. Now we're ready to do all of our parsing. But after that, once we get to the part where we're parsing this, we already know we've read this entire image because we use the content length from the HTTP request header. We already use that content length. We know we have the entire file. We know every, all the information's here. And we also know where it ends. It ends when we find the boundary. So we can compute the size of that file. We have all the information we need to be able to compute that. It would just be redundant information to put content link there. And its biggest purpose of making sure you read all of the data off the TCP stream before parsing, uh, that's irrelevant because we already handled that. So no content length in the parts. And then the big one, we get to the bytes of the file. And we have to be sure to never, ever, 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 ever treat this as a string. You saw on homework one, it's easy to do on accident. Even if you know, oh, those, that's the bytes of a file. I'm not going to encode that using UTF-8 or ASCII or anything. Uh, even when you know that, it's easy to do on accident. It's very easy to accidentally convert these into a string. And then your entire file is corrupt after that. Because those bytes of any file, anything that's not actually a string, those bytes are not going to comply with UTF-8. It's just not going to be a valid UTF-8 string. You're going to get decoding errors or encoding errors. And depending on your language and libraries and everything, uh, they're going to handle those errors differently. Some of them will just crash your program. Some of them will do, the, do their best job to try to encode as a UTF-8 string. Um, but no matter what, you're not going to be able to recover the bytes of your file. Your file is corrupt after that. You've corrupted the file because uh, it's not UTF-8. You're going to have JPEGs for the homework, uploading JPEGs. They are not going to be valid UTF-8 strings. It had to be a miraculous coincidence for an image to just accidentally um, be a valid UTF-8 encoding. It's not going to happen. Yes? If, if you were, like, let's say you made a copy and you were to encode like some type of, or like some type of UTF-8, uh, would that like crack the, uh, the server, or does it depend? Like if I were to take up an image and mm -hmm. do UTF-8, would it just would I get like a it, crack? It depends on your language and library. It depends on your language mostly, okay. and, and what exactly uh, you're doing with that in that language. Uh, so the the language itself will have different error handling based on you know, the developers of that language. Uh, like Python typically just crashes. Uh, but we had a demo in Python where it didn't crash. I forget exactly how I was using it. Uh, but, uh, but it didn't crash. It just gave me garbage, which is usually what I expect from languages. Most languages will just give you garbage, uh, which I don't even know what's better. Would I rather have my program just crash or, or what? But uh, either way. You're not getting points. I mean, it, your, your app's not going to work, and your users are going to be pissed because uh, the image is corrupt. You're never going to get back to your image. Right, right. That's the important part. But uh, whether it crashes or gives you garbage bytes uh, is however the developers of that language wrote it. Because like, would it be viable to, like, let's say you get this whole request, and then you make a copy of it, and then that copy 
Correct, because you just decode like the entire thing with the CFA. Mm -hmm. And you can read, but you can read all the headers. And then you have the original copy that you do. What do you mean? If you made a copy, corrupted the copy, and then went back to the original? Yeah. I mean, like I mean, you could. Copy. I mean, just don't do that, though. <laughs> like, if you notice that happening, just delete that code and, and do it right. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, but, like, it wouldn't be by reference, if that's what you mean. It wouldn't go back and corrupt the original. Right. Um, but once you corrupt that copy, like, that copy's shot. Like, you can't use that anymore. Those bytes are gone. You lost information. They could go back to the, the original HTTP request. Oh, I, I think I see what you're saying, right? So, so what you want to do is convert this whole thing to a string, do all of your parsing and do all the header stuff, and then go back to the original, find the bytes of the file. Exactly, because then you could do, like, you could save the header, like the long way down. Yeah, the yeah, I, 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 see, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it, maybe. I mean, if it's Python, it's probably going to crash. Uh, you could catch that error. Maybe. <laughs> you, you might. Could you? I'll say maybe, but please don't. <laughs> it's just asking for trouble. All right, so we have to do byte parsing. We're moving on from string parsing, and we're going to start talking about byte parsing. Of course, we'll use a lot of string parsing still, but we have to start off with byte parsing. So we're going to look for this information in the world of bytes. So to do this, when we get a request, we're going to look for certain boundaries in bytes, separate on those boundaries, and then we can start parsing in strings using subarrays of the byte arrays, which the syntax, of course, will be different in each language. Uh, but in general, the very first thing you want to do you get a request. This whole request is going to be in bytes. And we want to look for that slash r slash n slash r slash n. That's the first most important piece of information we need to read. Because then we can separate the headers from the body. The body is going to contain an image for the, in this case. So we need to ignore that for now and just get the headers. So we can parse the headers, get that content length, make sure we read the entire body and then get that boundary to be able to parse the boundary, uh, to parse the, uh, the, uh, the body. So what we want to do is take this slash r slash n slash r slash n and encode it into bytes using buffer.from, using dot encode, whatever, to get it into the world of bytes. Get that as a byte array, and then look for that subsequence of bytes inside your request without converting this to a string. So we're going to leave this as a byte array, which is how you get it over the TCP socket. Leave it as a byte array. Look for that sequence of bytes. And then everything before the first occurrence of that sequence of bytes, that's going to be your headers. And then you can convert that to a UTF-8 string. Take everything before that slash r slash n slash r slash n bytes and that's the first occurrence of, and that's your headers. Now your headers, remember, are guaranteed to be ASCII strings. HTTP 1.1 says headers ASCII only. And this is where that comes in handy. We know we're not going to have any non-text bytes. Uh, we know we're not going to have any UTF-8, which, yeah, it's a little outdated now. Um, but we know we're not going to have any non-text bytes in the headers, so we can safely decode that and treat it as a string. So everything before that first blank line, we know we can decode as a string. And then we can parse using all the string parsing that we use for homework one, get all the relevant information out of this, these headers, uh, do our routing based on the type of the request and the path, all that stuff we're familiar with. We can do all that in the world of strings. So you don't have to throw away anything from homework one in that regard. Take all that header parsing code that you wrote and throw it at this after you separate the headers from the body. Then we're going to get this boundary. We're going to prepend those two dashes. This is in the world of strings. And then we can convert that. Our body is still in the world of bytes. So we're going to prepend those two dashes and look for this boundary in bytes. 
So we're going to take that boundary with the two dashes, two leading dashes, convert it to bytes, just like we did the slash r, slash n, slash r, slash n. We're going to convert it to bytes and look for that sequence of bytes in the body. Because we can't convert this to a string yet because we've got these bytes of the file sitting there. So we're going to look for the boundary and separate these two parts by using the boundary in bytes. Now we know the boundary won't appear anywhere in our data, so we can safely say every time we find that, it's a new part. And the last time we find it with the trailing dash dash, that's the end of the body, which you'll also know because you read content length, you'll know that you've reached the end of the body anyway. Uh, you, you can write code to figure uh, multiple ways to find out that that's, the last, uh, that that's the last part. So get these two parts, and then start the process over. On each part, look for the new line, in bytes, separate the headers from the body, headers from the content, look for that new line in bytes, separate the headers from the content, and then figure out how to parse things. At that point, at that point, you parse these headers after looking for the new line, everything after the headers. Um, and at this point, you should have the bytes of the file isolated. You should have those bytes and only those bytes in some variable and some uh, data structure, you know, however you're organizing things. Just the bytes of the file without any boundaries, without any headers, without any blank lines, nothing. Just the bytes of the file. And now you can take those bytes of the file and save them on your server. Save that as a file. So open a file in, write, uh, in WB write bytes mode and just dump those bytes into that file. Give it some name of your choosing, and you successfully had a user upload a file, uh, upload a file to your server. So it's important to work in the world of bytes. We're looking for that new line in bytes. We're looking for the boundary in bytes. Separate all the inf then looking for the new line again in bytes. Work in the world of bytes, and then each time you peel off a piece. Like we're peeling off these headers in the box right here. Once we peel that off and we isolated those, we know that those have to be ASCII, ASCII characters, so we can treat that as a string, do our string parsing. Then everything after, in this case, we found out that that's the bytes of a file, which we can never convert to a string, so we're never going to. We're going to chunk this off in pieces, convert to strings when we know we can, and then when we can't, we're going to, do, uh, we're going to find that out, find that information, isolate it, and then do what we need to do with that. In this case, save it as a file. And when you save the file, you're free to, to have any naming convention you'd like. Uh, having a, a counter that increments and naming them like image one, image two, image three, that JPEG, perfectly fine. Um, but you're free to name them whatever you want. Uh, I wouldn't use the user supplied name just makes things more difficult, and like I said earlier, we can have naming conflicts. Uh, in introduces a whole new bag of problems. At that point, you support file sharing. You already know how to serve files, so if you name them like file one, file two, file three, it's easier to serve them. You're, you're asked to have one page that serves all of the uploaded files. If you have an HTML template like you have from homework one, and have your counter, how many files have been uploaded, and you're naming your files file one, file two, file three. Look at that counter, go to your template, loop, and add image uh, source file one, file two, file three, and so forth. Have used your same code from homework one to host all those files. We already know how to do that. Now we know how to upload files, and now we have a file sharing uh, website, which will be hard coded for images for homework two. Uh, hosting general files is a bit trickier. but. Uh, but we have a generic um, image sharing website. And very quickly, the, the security stuff I want to save till next time, like I said. But quickly, I want to show you. Don't want that. Oh, I'm in the wrong thing. So this is what you're going to get. There's not enough time to, to do the live demo, so you have to trust me. This is how we got it. Uh, this is, I'm printing out a request using the same HTML that we saw for the demo last time. I'm printing out a request, but I'm printing it out in bytes. Uh, in Python, when you print out a byte, 
string. If it's ASCII characters, it will actually display the characters for us. But we're going to see the information of uploading a file and how we're going to get it on our site. And I do recommend doing this. You can see everything. It's hard to see all the white space when you just print it as a string. But here we can see all of the bytes. We have the header line, our slash r slash n, our new lines, all of our headers separated by new lines. If we go far enough, We can see our boundary here. No, that's, here it is. So if we go far enough, we can see our first slash r slash n, slash r slash n. This means we've hit the end of the headers. All the headers come before this. Here's our header with the boundary. And then we see our first piece of information, our header with the content disposition. That's the only header in this case. Our new line, which we're looking for. And then, oops, I just whacked my keyboard apparently when I generated this. I was going to do another one live during lecture with more meaningful information. I just whacked my keyboard with GF uh, in this case. And then a new line before the boundary. I should have mentioned this in the slides. A new line before the boundary. So we should be prepending new line dash dash uh, and then boundary because there will be a new line at the end of each piece of content. And then we're going to see the next one. The next piece of information, and oh, I kept it named comment. And then I uploaded a file, it happened to be a PDF here. The browser knew that and gave me a PDF content type. And then the new line, the, the blank line, which I'm looking for to signify the end of my headers again. And then all of the bytes of my file. Oh, I didn't get the whole request. So this is bigger than my buffer. The file was bigger than my buffer. So I didn't get all the bytes, but we're going to have all the bytes of the file, another new line, the boundary, dash, dash, and that's the end of our request. So that's your target for homework two. This is the big, the bulk of homework two is parsing this stuff and getting this file uploaded to the server. And we're, uh, we're out of time. I'll, uh, we can talk after class. So. so we're out of time. So I'll see everybody Friday.